Welcome back to the Better Men, Better Ball Player Podcast. I'm your host, Trey Cobb. I want to thank you for joining us on our 114th episode of the podcast, where we get a chance to talk to Hall of Famer, legend, Ed Blankmeyer. Coach Blankmeyer is the former manager of the Brooklyn Cyclones. He is the former St. John's head coach. During his tenure, he is the 1996 to 2020 he became the winningest coach in St. John's history. He won six Big East Conference regular season championships, five Big East tournament championships, appeared in a Super Regional. He is the winningest coach in Big East history, ABCA Hall of Famer, ranked top 25 of all Division I coaches in career wins. He also had three different tours with USA Baseball as one of Any coaches really highlight to wear USA across the chest, as Coach Blankmar would tell you. Um, This conversation was just a true baseball, great conversation. We hit the ground running from the get-go. Coach Blankmar, to a T, discusses just everything from what he feels coaching is all about. She says coaching is coaching, but it's coaching about relationships Developing that relationship with the players, that the player develops trust, the player <clears throat> shows that you care, and you're trying to tweak things, trying to coach them up. That's when the coaching really happens. So it's really all about relationships. We dive into how I'm making a great practice, what good players do, how good players are routine driven, and to touch base about all those routines. Talks about specific things he would do in the in the fall. Certain scenarios that kind of make him green ready, help his pitchers and hitters in certain situations. Northeast, being a Northeast guy, you have to do with weather. What do you do? How do you? What's your perspective on it? How can you make decisions? We touch base about that. How is using use of video helping guys helping guys understand the game? Um, some of the most I would say the most notes that I've taken uh, in a while uh, with the conversation just kept on rolling. Things that just kept my mind going and. And I think that it would provide value uh, for multiple people for multiple levels and talk about always different ways to do things, um, different ways to saying things, just reiterating a lot of great things from his mental skills to discussing the communication for pitchers to go in, discussing a lot of great baseball stuff. It was a great conversation. Really appreciate Coach Blank Byron taking the time to talk just like you got to appreciate our guys at netting pros netting professionals are improving programs one facility at a time netting professionals specialize in design fabrication and installation of custom netting for backstops batting cages dugouts scoreboards bp screens and ball carts they also design and install digital graphic wall padding windscreen turf turf protectors dugout benches dugout cubbies and more netting professionals continue to provide quality products and services to many recreation high school and college fields facilities and stadiums throughout the country Contact them today at 844-620-2707 or info at nettingpros.com. Visit them online at www.nettingpros.com or check out Netting Pros on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn for all their latest projects and products. So again, thanks to Will Meyer. Thanks to this guy's Netting Pros for helping sponsor the podcast and help us get the message out there. So thanks for you guys. Hopefully you enjoyed it. I know I did. It's a great – get ready for your notes – uh, I've got notes in Podbean um, all the time. But without further ado, love to hear this conversation. Enjoy it with legendary coach Ed Blankmeyer. I, I thought, uh, you know, I spent so much time in, in college baseball that uh, I wanted just to try something different, you know, and um uh, not knowing the landscape of what I was getting involved in. I was asked a question uh, in my interview process. So why you, do you want to, um, you know, get involved in pro baseball? And, and I basically said the same thing I did when I was, you know, trying to get a real good college job. I says, I just want to develop a, a winning program in the organization I get involved with. Okay. I want to develop a winning program, a winning culture. Um, and I thought, you know, the Mets spoke to me several times during the course of my career. And, um, I thought at that particular time, my son was out, um, financially we're fine because quite frankly, 
if you look at college baseball and pro baseball, college baseball pays much better. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's amazing. And uh, I, I, I'm sure you have friends that are probably in a professional game. When I found out what was uh, going on financially uh, in the landscape and the development area of, college, of professional baseball, I was kind of flabbergasted. But I knew that was going to be, I knew it was going to take a hit. And um, I like the fact when I was with the Mets, they hired me as both a coordinator and a manager. And now understand when I took the job, uh, it was under the, uh, the Wilpon regime with Brody Van Wagenen as the uh, general manager. Um, and, you know, I was going to be a complex coordinator and then manage the short season. Well, as we all know, uh, there was a downsizing of minor league baseball. So it changed what I, what I came in going to do. Yeah. Sort out the window. Yeah. In, in two respects, one uh, the downsizing of, <clears throat> of minor league baseball. And two, uh, a year after I got in, you know, baseball is a great game, but a bad business. Uh, you know, they went on and had a new um, leadership group and Brody was out along with his, his group as, and they brought in uh, uh, another, another group. And now they even went to another group. Mm. So um, I, I became a manager of a full season team. Uh, and, and my, my, re, you know, my coordinating responsibility was reduced. So, you know, I guess timing is everything. Uh, I came in thinking I was going to have other uh, responsibilities and uh, I ended up become, becoming a full season manager. And I was asked to manage again, but then they felt that they, they wanted me to coordinate. And uh, I don't think I wanted to spend uh, seven months down in Port St. Lucie. Yeah. I was more interested in, um, uh, you know, other things. So, and then that's when the, <clears throat> the um, Cubs called, offered me the minor league field coordinator position, took it. And then I just said, hey, enough is enough. I just, it's different. You don't, you're not in, how about this simply saying, Trey, you're not in control. Um, and I realized I wouldn't be in control, but I don't want to use the word chaos, but just a lot of moving parts and you don't have the opportunity to have as much input as you would like. I'm not saying make the call, but at least be asked make to make some calls. Yeah. And that, that, that kind of threw me for a loop. Uh, you know, running my own program for 24 years and then being assistant at Seton Hall and basically, you know, having a lot of responsibility as the associate head coach. I was not used to, you know, not having some control. So um, but the experience was good uh, to me. I don't care what level it is. Coaching is coaching. It's about relationships, uh, getting to know the players, getting the players to trust you, getting the players to to care about what they're doing, teaching players routines, you know, holding them accountable. Every level, it's about that. And I've had an opportunity, uh, you know, uh, just to back up a bit. Uh, when the COVID hit, I became the alternate site coordinator. Uh, if you're familiar hmm. with alternate site, uh, the Mets alternate site was in Brooklyn, and I ran the alternate site for half the summer, as well as being an instructor there. And I thought that was pretty cool getting, you know, the alternate site was the reserve players and it was kind of players going up and down during that particular time. Um, so I, you know, so I, I, I've had the triple A, four A players and prospects. I've also dealt with the lower level guys. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's about relationships. And I had a good bunch of guys and uh, I thought that was my strong suit. And I just wish, um, maybe I just, just wish I'd, I, that's more say. Yeah. Not necessarily they're going to take my take my advice or you know agree with what I'm you know putting forth, but you know I think they should listen a little bit more. So that's the end of that story. Yeah, that's a great story. You know, especially I think because I'd love to dive into that like coaching is coaching and and then the things that you um, like you that you feel like are pillars you know of coaching with the relationships the accountability you talked about routines too like what kind of routines uh what kind of routines uh would you 
Is it about like the everyday kind of like how you live routines or are you talking like within like even like the game? I, I, yeah, it's both. I mean, you know, I, I think players, the good players are routine driven. Uh, they have a daily routine when they get to the ballpark. They go through a whole sequence of things. Um, and then as you develop in your game or your game, whatever your position is, you have a routine, whether it's practice or game, what you do. If you're a hitter, okay, you go through a hitting routine. You know what feels good to you. Uh, you have maybe scripts of different type of BPs you like to take. Uh, you get assistance in that regard. And then there's the game preparation routine that you have in regards to, uh, you know, what is the scouting report? How much information can you take? What are you looking for in your scouting report? You know, when you do an advanced report pro ball, as you go up the ladder, there's a volume of information and I can get 10 hitters and not going to, you know, you can't give the same, the hit, these hitters, the same information. Some guys want more, some guys want less. Some guys only want a few things. Um, so when you when you when you're training these guys at the lower level, you're trying to develop their routines. Certainly, you're trying to get them to to understand, you know, how to take care of themselves, get to the ballpark on time, your, your nutrition, or uh, you know, your strength and conditioning protocol, you know, your 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 game preparation work, which is we talk about your your game routines, what you do during that that workout time and then there's obviously the game and your game preparation in regards to your scouting reports and how you prepare yourself mentally and then there's the post after the game after you eat your, your nutrition any t any type of uh, debriefing you do um and then the cycle starts all over again uh I, I just think the good players uh have a routine um they stick to it don't don't get me wrong they will tweak it but it gets them through the season instead of scrambling uh, so, and younger players, it's, uh, it's, it's sometimes it's scattered older players, you know, when you're dealing with an old pro, you don't go up there and tell them what to do. Okay. You watch their routines and you talk to them a little bit and Hey, Hey, what about this? Or what about that? They may buy in by not, but like it's, man, with older guys until they trust you, they ain't listening to you. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, if they get to know you, uh, and they see how you work and, you you know, you, you start developing a rapport. Every once in a while, you can you can throw in something that may be helpful. Hey, take it for what it's worth. Here's what I see. What do you think? Yeah, that's a good idea. Or, eh, hey, go, you know, yeah. take a hike. I don't know. Uh, but, you know, this is what you try to teach them. And I, th I think I think, you know, good players are routine driven. And so I'm just thinking in terms of because there's a lot of college guys or other you know, like youth guys or like high school guys like listening in. So like. How did you dive that in? Maybe at St. John's, like, you know, at the college level. And then how would you even uh, advise even the high school guy to kind of build in? Like you said, the understanding is that good players are routine driven. Right. So then how do you build? How did you build that at St. John's at the college level? And how could you see that at the high school? Well, again, what we try to do is we try to establish routines within, uh, you know, well, let's talk on the field first. <coughs> routines on the field. I mean, if I'm an infield coach, I have a group of drill segments that I use, okay? And by the time the fall is over, these guys know the drills, okay, that we do. Okay, so we're not wasting time on teaching drills. I think a lot of the work in breaking down the game is you work through drills and let the drills and let them adapt to the drills to accomplish what you're trying to do. So we would have a drill – each of our position coaches would have drill sequences along the way. That also applies to our hitters. And uh, what we try to do from a hitting perspective is, okay, <coughs> excuse me, what routine works for that hitter? What is his preparation prior to his batting practice? What type of batting practice does he need? Okay. And then we would filter in what we need to do team-wise. Okay. So it's an individual development routine complemented by team development skills. And then we try to filter in as we settle in and all that thing is within the framework, we try to get a competitive uh, situations to challenge them. Now you can, you can drill all you want and, and you can, you don't pressure them. How do you know whether that drill is working? 
okay, or, or, or your drill sequence are working. So we try to make them play the game as fast or faster than they used to. So when they get into a game mode, they become more comfortable. Okay. Uh, that's the type of culture you have now off the, you know, you know, the whole day routine is, is basically scheduled. Uh, what I mean by that, you know, we have our lift scheduled. Okay. You know, uh, pre-workout, post-workout. If we need a post-workout, uh, post-strength training workout, we have it. For, they know when their framework of classes are, and they know the framework of free time if they want individual one-on-one -on -one or small group work. And then we have our team segment. And within our team segment, there is a skeleton, a basic skeleton of how we go about our practice. We can fluctuate the practice, but there's always individual development. There's always team development in there. And obviously there's preparation for our hitters and pitchers because basically the game is, it comes down to pitching and hitting. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 it's a game of one-on-one. -on -one. That's a game of one-on-one. -on -one. And you look at it, that's how you, that's how you break down the game. So you really have to, you really have to focus on your hitters and your pitchers be able to perform in, in, in a stressful environment. How did you create that stress? Like, what were some what were some way, great ways to create that stress? Or like you said, the the competition. A competition. Okay, we used to have, have play a game called one pitch, uh, especially in the fall. And what I mean by one pitch, we would script the pitches for the pitchers. We would script counts. We would script situations for our hitters. And the, the guy would get his warm up in the bullpen, come in, complete the script, and the game is going on. Uh, you know, a 15 pitch or 20 pitch routine, uh, a, a script would take about 15 minutes. Okay. And we may cover a bunt coverage. Okay. We may do a hit and run. We may steal. Okay. Most of the script involved situation with runners on base because to me, pitching and hitting, it's about runners on base. Mm -hmm. You got to either do damage or you got to execute. You got to try to hit behind a runner. Whatever you're trying to do. We're also trying to get that pitcher to throw certain pitches in certain situations. Um, so it's almost a game that's sped up. There's action every pitch, whatever it may be. We may ask him to pick. We may have a pickoff play at second base. So it's, it's basically situation, count, pitcher knows the pitch, pitcher we sign in, and we execute. That That to me, and we would do that, you know, quite a bit early before we actually get into our, get into our, um, our, our inter-squad situations. And I think it really prepares kids because, you know, to me, a bullpen is a bullpen and people, you know, they do crazy things in a bullpen to create pressure, <clears throat> but it's not like the real thing where you're on the mound, nobody's around you, you know, people are running around, people are yelling and screaming, whatever it may be, you know, you, 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 know, you got action and you, and you, and I think, I think, it's beneficial. After the boy has finished his script, he completes, he goes back out to the pen and he finishes his work. He may need to work on his changeup. You throw a fastball changeup sequence, whatever it may be. He knows after he warms up, he has that 15, 20 pitch grip. He goes back and he finishes his bullpen and he yeah. and that's, that's his work. So that, that, that to me is beneficial. Uh, the other thing from a defensive end, we, we, we run a lot of live defensive work. Ball off bat. Ball off bat is extremely important. Uh, we'll do it in batting practice. We'll do short toss. We do, we'll, we'll do, we'll do it with the T. We'll do regular batting practice with a small ice cream. Okay. Uh, we'll do it both for the infield and outfielders. Okay. Play balls off bat. And then you put the time clock on it. You put the time clock on it in regards to they know, you know, you know, we, 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 I have a whole segment of times. Um, where balls hit to the outfield, it's a base hit. We want to get it in under under eight seconds from contact yep. the ball to the play, uh, you know. And then we'll, we'll vary times at first base, you know, four or five runner, you know, four two runner, you know, four one runner. Balls hit. Okay, so they're they're, they're reacting uh, by time. So so we do that quite a bit, um, and uh, we like we do a lot of live D. I, I, you know, you, tr you try to get that as, as much as you possibly can in and it can, it, it can be done, you know, 10, 15 minutes of your practice time. It's, it's nothing. It's nothing. So those are the two kind of things. And then situationally, if you want to cover the bunt or you, you know, when you, when you're really defining the game and playing the game, what do you got to define? You got to play the batted ball. 
and I, I did a statistical um, breakdown of that and, and, you know, batted ball sequences. I call it the eight dirty words. There's eight situations in a game that you're going to see, but four of them come up probably 75 to 80% of the time. That's right. Nobody on which comes up anywhere between 40 five to 65 percent of the time depending on the situation in the game yeah. run on first run on first and second and then everybody practices first and third it comes up like four percent of the time well what you know we'll practice all the situations trey but we know we focus on what happens the most that we have to we have to handle okay so from a from a situational standpoint we'll work on things hey once a week we may work on first and third live where we have some pitches come out of the pen, <clears throat> we'll, we'll put the runners on and we'll create live activities for spark, you know, delayed steal, and we will we'll react to it. Uh, we'll shorten the field and we'll play a bunt game. We'll have our outfielders bunt. Okay. Pitches on a mound. We'll put a small ponzer out there and shoot the ball guy bunts and we react to it. situations. Um, and then we'll have a hit game where we'll run, hit, hit, run. We'll have our outfielders out there and see how they respond. Do they go for the advancing run or they, do they throw behind for the ball? Uh, but again, you cover your batted ball, okay? You all you always cover your pop fly communication because, you know, that's, you know, excuse the expression, it's just going to happen there when that ball goes up sometimes. <laughs> you cover the steal, you cover the bunt, okay? That's that's the kind of things you do, and then then there's the special situations that you'll you'll delve into, and typically in special situations you introduce it, but prior to a uh, a conference weekend or whatever, you'll you'll review a Thursday situation if there's somebody likes the safety squeeze or a team runs a lot, they try to they they try to steal third on you. We'll break some things down along the way. So that's how we throw it all together. Yeah, that's cool. I was thinking, um, just like the first uh, thing that came to mind was like, uh, oh, uh, when you talked about, um, because I love the differences and just like putting the time in, um, uh, defining the different game situations. Um, just thinking about, oh, what was it? The runner on. Um. Oh, so speaking of like your times on the defense, like are and and they, like competing with it. Do you compete as a team? Like, hey, we got to make so many plays, or is it like, did you compete between like different groups when they're you taking know, that live defensive work? Most of the time, I we just competed against the clock. Okay, uh, we didn't. Tra- we we tracked it. We tracked it. You know, but again, when you're playing a, a a fast game like that in a BP setting, you 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 like to have both your infields out there because one guy gets up, next guy goes. Yeah. you, you want to keep the practice moving as okay. much as possible we can. So more than likely, it's like that. And I, even with my outfielders, I would do the same thing because, you know, if, you, if, if, you're, if you're, you're shooting balls out there off the bat, okay, you know, you, you don't want to blow the guys up. You know, the, the, the interesting thing, and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll caveat into pro baseball here, the, the emphasis on um, the game of baseball, uh, I'll, you know, I'll be candid about this. Outside of spring training, you don't do any basic team fundamentals. They expect the kids to know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what I did, I mean, I was, I was surprised because I wanted to spend some time on a pop fly communication. <clears throat> Reason why there's a, there's a workload issue. They <coughs> do me to get involved with the workload. And I said, pop fly communications or a live D situation or, or a multiple infield situation. And, you know, puts too much. I, I said, I'll, I'll, I've been done. I said, I've done this for years. I'll, I'll read you know, fatigue. So they don't really emphasize that. Whereas in the college game, and especially in the high school game, you're teaching the players how to play. Mm-hmm. You're teaching the players how to play. And I'll tell you, you know, um, I, I was in, like I said, the, the, the uh, high A and high A that year in 2021 was more like low A. Mm-hmm. Okay. For some of the things I saw done. Um I wish they would spend more time in your in your work time. It's all focused on hitting, doing damage to the baseball, and and your pitching. Uh, they figure the game basically is going to teach itself. So what did I do? Here's what I did. I would after every game, we, I would have our video guy clip plays. So I would go in with my card and I say I want this play clip, and during our advanced meeting, I would go over the plays. Okay. Hey, look at this double cut. What did we do right? What did we do wrong? And I clip 
good and bad on each side. I get the opposing team did something great. What did they do well? Okay. Okay. Or what, where were you not backing up you offside alpha? I said, look at you standing there. Ball's hit here. The ball's thrown behind and you're standing in right field still. What are you doing? Okay. So that's the way I taught because I didn't have access to actually doing mm -hmm. so videotaping and game videotaping and game clipping, I think is a valuable lesson. And, uh, I said, much, you know, you met Ty, you know, you, you know, Ty, Ty was at Wake Forest and, uh, my pitch, former pitching coach was there, and I said, "This is what you guys got to do." So they, they they do that all the time. Everything's videoed and clipped. What does it take you? Five minutes, ten minutes, maybe. Uh, to so go over? You just mean you mean to go over it? Just go over it. Yeah, go over it, and then you know you, you hustle. You can you can put you can put in great plays. You can spice it up anyway. You know, I I coached uh, the kid Francisco Alvarez, the number one prospect in in minor league baseball, and he hits a home run, and everybody you know everybody wanted you know. I said, okay, I go, Frankie, take a look at the guy down below. There's two guys down below chest bumping each other. That's, I said, that's what I wanted you to do. They're chest bumping each other. And he, oh, I, oh, Eddie, I like that. You know, <laughs> so you, you made it comical. So they're paying attention. You know, you put some humor into it. But it's, it's, it's a great learning tool if you don't has, have access to actually working on it. So, um, but I'm thinking, like I, you said, too, I think people can use that even like, uh, you think about late in the season, you know, and you're, you're, you're monitoring workload and things like that. You just have more film sessions where, like, look, yeah. we're not going to rep it out. We can talk about it. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's great. I think the use of video is super good. I think that is, quite frankly, for learning the game of baseball, that's number one in my book. Okay, because you can show the situation and you can cover a lot of it. You know, in this game, you'll, you're you going to say, okay, I've never seen that before. Mm -hmm. Okay, so these anything and, you know, you're not talking about a lot of things that occur, um, but, you know, I, I just think it's a, it's a great learning tool. For sure. For certain. Like, were you able to. During your time at St. John's, like, were you able to to utilize video and yeah. would there be other ways that you would also utilize video? Yeah. 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 Um, obviously. You're utilizing video, for, you know, for, for development, individual mm -hmm. development. Obviously, uh, if, if you're looking at your hitters, you want to get some sort of uh, anthology of where they are, where they start, okay, where they are currently. And I always stress with our hitting coaches, I, I said, I want to make sure that we ca catalog when they're swinging a bad good. Because because everybody starts looking, oh, that guy's not swinging, and, and they start dissecting the dude. Mm. And you're in there, you're ripping the kid apart. Now you're not doing this. I want to, okay, I would, for, I would look side by side and see if I can depict anything. I, you know, maybe you moved your hands up, or maybe I could find something so simple that will trigger him. Okay, so, uh, you know, cataloging. Good at bats is was important to me, and the same thing with pitching. I would like to. I, I always like to look at open side, even backside sometimes, and and, and obviously behind a catcher to, to get a view of what they're doing. Okay, <clears throat> to you know to to make sure what are we missing anything? Um, uh, <clears throat> infield wise, the same thing. I mean, infield wise, we 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 do a lot of our work. We would we would we would clip things during the course of a game you can see that and you can really determine okay where are we making our mistakes or where is this guy failing he's made 12 errors okay what are the errors most of the cases it's the throwing error why is it is it going to glove side backhand side so you kind of try to dissect what they're doing okay and see what the problem is and then look at the problem and see what 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 you can do to resurrect the problem okay so that's how we do it from a defensive end um, and then obviously you can, you take as much video as you can in an individual or small group environment. So you can get more reps along the way. So, but I, I just think live reps and live looks, uh, when it comes to defending, hitting and pitching, it's more realistic than a stage look, you know, I'm, last I looked, everybody looks pretty damn good in the batting cage. Right. Well, what's the problem? Is it visual? Is it timing? Or is it mechanical? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Or is it not? Or is it game speed? If it's game speed, whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. So you know, as you know as well as I, you coach enough guys in the infield that makes all the plays in in, in, in you know in practice, and all of a sudden the game comes round ball and mm-hmm. what is he? Is he late? Is his pre step late? Okay. Is he pass it to the ball? Okay. Is it a mechanical throwing situation? Is the footwork bad? Uh, but in, until you test them in, in, in the environment of pressure or game, uh, you, you, you may be missing something. Sure, maybe missing. Something. And and I, I and I just I'm just actually thinking through what your situation one pitch. You actually had then your pitchers on the game mound then too. Yeah, yeah. Because you got to think yeah. about that. Like how many pitchers only throw in the game mound during like in their in the game? That's it. Yeah, yeah, you think of think about that, and especially when you're dealing with some new and young kids. Okay, the more you can get a person on the mound facing a batter, the better off you are. I mean, you put them in, and, and pitching to me is it's very very easy when you pitch in a bullpen. You neglect your glove, your glove to glove times, and this guy's guy, he's one step one seven to the plate from the stretch. I said, what the, you know. What, what are we doing here? This is going to be a track meet. You know, we got to be able to defend the steel. Okay. So you're putting him in that environment. You're clocking him. Okay. You're putting pressure. You're making him throw pitches to execute pitches. Okay. He doesn't know the, he knows the situation. He doesn't know if there's going to be an execution. Okay. Cause the, all, all the, <clears throat> the coach knows all the coaches know. Okay. The batter will know when you sign in <clears throat> the pitcher. Knows the situation. He doesn't know going to run. Hey, possible bunt. Hey, nobody out. Run on first base. 1-0 count. Well, what could it be? It could be hit and mm-hmm. run. It could be a bunt. You don't know. So it, you try to put it into a, a – and it put them in a stressful situation so that they become more, more, more and more comfortable as they go. Yeah, I just wonder, like, have you ever thought, like, why is our game so different in that where it's like we have to be like – you got you don't you don't have as many coaches putting it in like just game speed like you wouldn't go to a basketball practice and not see them play five on five, yeah. you know you don't see them like why is it why do you feel like or have you thought about like why is it why is our game so different and why and I think it's making changes, but why do you think it's been like that? Well, you know, as the expression goes, sometimes you can't teach the old dogs new tricks. If it's not broken, they don't think you have to fix it. Uh-huh. I think, um, in essence, even in, in the pro game and in, in, in the development programs in the minor league system, certainly I think so, a lot of college coaches are very innovative. Uh, they understand you have the challenge and pressure. Uh, if you don't pressure, how you know? How do you know whether the player is going to react? And how how is the player going to react? How comfortable is he going to get? You don't know anything about the person. If everything is fine and dandy and everything's easy, okay. And you don't you don't tax him. You don't know how he's going to respond. This game, okay, is played pitch by pitch every roughly twenty seconds. Okay, sometimes that you could be standing at shortstop for the whole game. You may not even get a ball. Mm-hmm. Okay, but you do have to play the pitch every pitch. Mm-hmm. And so that on and off mentality of pitch, rest, pitch, rest pitch rest as a position player pitcher whatever it may be okay that takes some getting used to and as you get up the level of plays okay the funnel of players and the talent becomes you know smaller and smaller they become better and better uh and and i think the ones that are able to handle that are the ones that end up you know moving up the ladder when you talked about routines too, is that something that you would teach like that pitch break, pitch break? Like yeah. how would you help guys kind of develop that mentality to kind of basically funnel in, focus on the pitch, game break, you know? You know, first of all, these uh, let's let's just address the pros first. Pros have mental coaches. Um uh I make I've made recommendations to our mental coaches and I'll backtrack now. Uh, what we do, what I did at uh, at St. John's, uh, prior to our stretch, okay, mm. we would go through mental routines. 
And one day, you know, the pitchers would go there through their routines. It may be a routine with runners on base from the stretch, a routine from the runners uh, with n- n- nobody on. Okay. Pre-pitch, post-pitch. Okay. Infield is the same thing. They step into the box. The routine, they're on. They step back out of the box. The routine begins again. And that incorporates something visual. Uh, it may be, it, it may include self-talk and it would always include breathing, but as you practice your physical skills, you have to practice your mental skills and your mental routine. Um, you try to, you, you know, you don't know sometimes if they really truly buy in, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> they truly buy in when, uh, you know, we emphasize, we, Hey, listen, meditation is good. This game is it's a mental game. It's a mental stress. Uh, so you, if you can teach them to breathe and to meditate so that they relax, I think they'll be more successful because it's a game of value. Game, game of adversity is a lot of pressure on you. You're going to fail an awful lot. Okay. So you want them to be able to relax as best they possibly can. Um, you know, I, I, I use the analogy and I, I, I like to, I'm not a golfer, but I like to golf. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> and when you try to hit the ball hard, what typically do you do? Uh-huh. You chunk it, you top it, you know. But if you watch it and you and you just relax and you just take a nice deep breath and you just take a nice swing, the ball goes a mile. And you say, hey, I got this figured out. And then, you know, it happens three, you know, three times in a row. Then all of a sudden you're back to the same old you you are. So I think the same thing with it, with pitches and hitters. You over try. You don't know what you, you know, you talk about. Maxing out and going 100. percent Hey, some guys have to go 95. percent Some guys are better off trying to be 70 percent of what they are. Oh, that's good. I mean, so you know, you have to find out the level of um, reaction or flow. I call it flow. Your flow, relaxation that you feel comfortable, so that you allow allows you to execute consistently. So it's a tough one. It's a tough one. And, it, you know, you know, you spend time on physical practice. If you expect them to do any type of mental routines, okay, or you, hey, talk about breathing, you have to practice it. And I think that there's a lot of programs in the country now that are doing more and more of the mental game because it is, it's a, it's a game of, you know, one pitch and being able to let one go. React to the next pitch. It's next, next pitch, next pitch, next pitch, and every pitch is a, it's a whole different breed, a whole different action. Coach, when when you know in your career did you make that switch? Has that always been something that you've you've believed? Is or did you feel like it at a certain time you guys just needed it more and you that's when you started? No, I, I I've been into this stuff for quite some time. As back as far as Alan Yeager was, mm-hmm. uh, those guys. Uh, Ken Revisa. I, I always bought into that, you know, because myself as a player, you know, I realized that, you know, hey, gee, I, you know, I was nervous at times. And I'm mm-hmm. saying, how, how best can I succeed? Okay. So worked on the breathing, worked on a box routine, you know. Uh, so it's on, I'm on deck. I worked on my routine there or whatever it may be and, and got in. Uh, I, I, I had some self-talk as I walked into the batter's box, and then I went through my routine. I guarantee you, if you watch a lot of the big league hitters, they have a routine when they step in that box. They want to be able – that's their go time, okay? And then they release it, step the foot out, and then they redo their routine, okay? I just think it gets them to relax and puts them in a, in a, in a good state of mind. Mm-hmm. And like you said, that these are things like – like let's say during your live defensive work, like you are teaching them even through that situation to like as you said, step in, go through your routine every time. Yeah, yeah, they they got it. Whatever your routine is, next guy up. Okay, it, it works fast. Okay, when you when you do some of these things, and you hope they can can get into their routine a little bit. <clears throat> when you work at a rapid rapid pace, sometimes I don't think they're going to get it all the time. But if there's a relaxation in between, there's a, a no pitch. Okay. You know, if it's bang, 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 sometimes you don't. Right. Uh, usually if there's a couple blows in between, you should be able to get back into it along the way. And again, when you talk about doing these type of uh, um, quick action, pressurized situation, 
you know, you got to give them some, give them some room as well. And to me, I'm, a, I'm a, I believe there's quality versus quantity. I don't want to overdo it. Um, give them 15 minutes or so or 12 minutes. You get a lot of reps in along the way. And it's just not the rep you would get defensively. You know, I call a rep is a rep is a prep, no swing. Okay. And there's a burst where you're moving towards the ball, no matter whether it's hit you or not. And then it's making the play. So you may be the shortstop. Okay. You step up and the ball's hit to the second baseman. Well, you're making a move in that direction or you're making a move towards the base, whatever you're doing based on the situation. And then obviously there's a ball that's in the vicinity. You're trying to make the play. So you're always making your move based on what you see in time with the release. <clears throat> the, the, the feet got to be in position and just about hitting the ground as a ball's entering um, the hitting zone. So you're re ready to react ball over your head or back. You're, you're drop stepping. So anytime you get a rep in there, there's a response to what you're doing based on what you see. And that's what you're trying to strive. Now, when you're practicing it, you can't do it all day. Mm -hmm. You want to give them quality reps where that, you know, if you, if they, if they, if they, if they say there's 50 pitches and you have two guys, you want at least 25 quality reps each, whether it's a swing and miss, whether it's a take, you're ready to go. So there's always a reaction. Because you're playing balls off, you're responding to what you see. And I think in a game, especially defensively, you know, if you if you watch players, you know, the guy has a good arm, and then all of a sudden you look up and he, the ball's hit, he ain't even moving. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And like, uh, I'll give you a scenario. I coached the national team, um, and the outfield was George Springer uh, in the left, um, Jackie Bradley Jr. in center, and then Mickey Mattuck in right. I'm going to tell you right now, out of the three guys, the slowest guy in the field was Jackie Bradley Jr., but he had the best jumps. I, I mean, it's like he's still to this day is probably one of the best center fielders. He just gets – but it's like the ball's hit, and you look up, and he's, he's, he's three steps into the track. Wow. So, you know, you, you, when you watch guys, and you, when and that's the, that to me is the key. Is that guy moving when ball's hit, and where is he in the movement? Uh, so – we track that. We watch that. And you can watch that off a of videotape. You can watch it. Is it, has that something that you could teach? Like, how would you like teach like get guys to read? Is it just reading angle the bell? Like, are you, how are you, how are you able to help your outfielders get jumps like that? Like reading the angle, the ball, knowing I'm going to. You are reading angle and you're reading contact. Well, you're anticipating. And if you really, if you really watch a good outfielder, you know, you know, you know what the ball's going to do if you're a left-handed hitter. It's going to either this to you, okay? It's almost anticipate. Or if he hooks it and pulls it, okay, is it going to smother towards the line? You got mm -hmm. all that stuff. You know that stuff. But it's responding to the contact of the bat. So you're reading barrel. That's mm -hmm. what you're ultimately doing. You're reading the barrel and the angle of the barrel more than anything else. Mm. Oh, yeah. So, okay, Coach, let me ask you this. So when – I'm just thinking because I had this co conversation with uh, it was funny. The VMI coach talked a lot about this too, like just put his pitchers on there. But how do you create? Because you've we talked about defense, we talk about pit. Like, how do you um, when you want to run deep base running wise, how are you making base running live in that situation too? <clears throat> live base running. Well, we, we typically do a you know, like back up, uh, we would do um, a warm up. Prior to, uh, to, to, to actually getting involved in our defensive segment, we would go through um, some base running routines. We would work on our technique. Okay. And then what we would do, depending on the day, we would put them in a base running situation. And if it, it may be runner, runner on first base, and we would, we would review base running steel cues that we have. And we, one of us would do it. Okay. And then we work on, you know, dirt ball, whatever it may be. So we would always work on technique first, reads first, and usually it's the coach doing it before we get into our defensive segment of the practice. <clears throat> then if our batting practice allows it, we would play live reads off the bat. I, I, I also, when I, when I say live reads off the bat, uh, we would put them in, you know, in our bat base running uh, or, or batting practice rounds, the hitter would know what we're trying to do at that particular time. 
I also would like what I what I did sometime for a couple of reasons. Um, you know, we would lot 45 minutes of batting practice, but 10 minutes of that batting practice, we may work on, okay, we're going to work on our signs today. And we would put players, put off four groups at different situations. And I would yell out the situation and we would sign in the play, work on execution. Or we would have simple, okay, we're going to work on run and hit today. And, you know, we put cones in the outfield as outfielders and they would read based on the outfielders. So it's say we're going to work on running hit. We let the guy in a fight. He's checking inside balls hit and he, and he kind of freezes. <clears throat> and when we work on freeze or read, it's always, <clears throat> we're reading a, a, a show. Our chest is towards the play. If we have made a response and we, we determine we're going, our shoulders are towards a bag, whether it's reversing back or not. So we try to uh, assimilate, uh, you know, simulate that as much as possible. And, that, and that's how kind of we did that along the way or base running within our batting practice segment. Mm. I like it. 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 And it, well, I think I also remember you said uh, within the one script uh, with the, I mean, sorry, the one pitch what, with one pitch, you would have certain situations there where your guys, I guess would possibly read a bond or maybe, I guess maybe there would yep. be maybe a, a pickoff and they would have to steal or. Yep. Yep, we would. Yeah, everything's in. Every, everything's scripted in, and we we had several scripts what we, what we wanted to do, and we would change the script. Uh huh. You understand? So this guy may come in, and we had a fifteen to twenty page script. Okay, the next guy comes. It's a totally different script. We had several scripts that we went to. Okay, it wasn't the same script over and over. So what we're doing, we were challenging ourselves in different situations. Now sometimes, okay, if it's uh, say so, like I talked about, a one zero count. Uh, pitch two was sack bunt. We fail it. Okay. We go to pitch three and may say runner on second base, you know, uh, two, two count. He would pitch, maybe try to execute the breaking ball. You drive him in. So <clears throat> you're trying to keep them thinking and be situation oriented pitcher, you know, situation oriented, execute the pitch batter situation oriented, execute, execute what you have to do. It's just all go through here too. Like, so do the base, uh, or do you have base runners out here during that time as well as your light, both all defensive guys, right? We have a field, field is out there. There's a team out there. Yes. And then we, we, we would pocket four or five hitters. Yeah. We would rotate. So in other words, you have a team and then what you, you may have three or four different type of teams you put out there. So what yep. does it allow you to do? It allows you to move your guys around if you need to move guys around. And it, it gives guys an opportunity. Okay, this these five guys are going to hit these 20 pitches. Okay, next pitcher comes in. These five guys are going to hit this position. And there's the, there's the outfield. So you rotate your catcher in. He rotates out. Okay. And we work within pockets of about five guys to do that. And depending on how you know, we have three different scripts that day. We got three pitches thrown batting practice. You know, you cover a lot of things and it, it makes them <coughs> excuse me, aware of what's going on. So let me, ask, let me ask a pitching question then, coach. Is so this kid who's coming up to throw the pitch uh to throw his script, is it is it his is it his bullpen day? So essentially, like where like he's <laughs> looking to get his bullpen in. Because like you said, you're gonna throw 15, 20 pitches here, yep. and then you're gonna go to the bullpen and finish. <coughs> it's a bullpen day <coughs> typically now if we you know we, we, we understand this is typically preparing for our inter squads in the fall yep. typically um being in the northeast we're in a lot of times inside early because of the weather and we'll script out things too but it's not obviously the same because you don't have use of the field okay but if we have time we will script a long way because it creates a refresher course getting the guys back, you know, from, from uh, winter break. Mm -hmm. um, but it's typically during that time. Now, if we wanted to change up and get away from an inter squad. Okay. We may have the guy come out twice, hmm. you know, or, yeah. or, you know, in other words, he comes out, we got three guys that day. He'll come up, he'll pitch one inning. Another guy will pitch an inning. Okay. Another guy pitch an inning. We kind of rotate him through. So, it just gives them, uh, uh, you know, a, a bullpen's a bullpen. Uh, I, I I know people try to make them competitive, but it's not the same as standing on the mound with runners on base. And, you know, the space awareness is totally different. Um, you're on the mound. Uh, you're actually controlling the running game. 
okay, with runners on base. And again, this is when we do this, that pitch is most of it's pitching from the stretch. Mm -hmm. Right. Most of the time. Um, you know, we have a tendency. So I watch some guys do pens and they, they throw too much from the windup. Now, if you haven't promised from the windup, I get it. Yeah. But actually to me, t pitching is, you know, being in control of the situation when the runners, you want to have that guy so damn comfortable. Okay. Okay. He's pressure on, but you know, typically, you know, the game starts to speed up when one is going on base. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> we, that, that's, what, that's just some of the things we tried, we tried to do. Yeah, it's great. Uh, it just, like I said, and getting comfortable being uncomfortable is really yeah. what you're trying to do. And yeah. it certainly is different with the guy on base, even the, even the, the hitter in there. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So you mentioned Northeast. So let's break out maybe some, you know, because being in the Northeast, you, like you said, you're inside, you're doing things, trying to be creative. You know, what was some of like the creative ways you, you've tried to get your work in um, that, you know, again, trying to get guys ready to play? Well, when I say, you know, going outside, we have a turf field now. Heck, in the old days when we didn't have a turf field and there's snow on the ground, we'd be on a parking lot. Right. Um, but now we go outside as much as we can, but we concern ourselves with uh, uh, when we take batting practice or when we're pitching live outside or competitively, we take into consideration, is it is it right for that player? Or mm. are we going to play – in this type of environment. Mm. Now, we'll may say, okay, we're not going to pitch and catch up. We're not going to hit and pitch outside. But we will take our players outside to, for an activity workout, mm. meaning we're going to get them out. They're warmed up. Okay. We'll warm up inside. We'll get them acclimated. We'll do some active stretch outside. We'll throw. We'll get into some sort of repetitive activity. Um, I don't like to do a lot of teaching outside in cold weather. The teaching is done in the classroom or in a locker room prior to if there's something that has to be covered. Um, and then it's work and repetitions in a small time frame. In the event, it's it's a difficult day to, to deal with along the way. Um, obviously, when the weather is playable, mm -hmm. we'll go out and play. We'll go out and play and We'll conduct our same work that we do in the fall as we would in the spring. I don't like when it's too cold. The inter squads will be modified um, because I don't like guys standing. You know, it, when it's cold out there and and you're playing an inter squad game um, and you have mounds of dirt, of uh, snow around you, it's not a fun thing. It's a me mentally draining situation when you're looking around. There's mounds of snow around you. Um, but you do the best you can with what you have. That's right. That's right. You know, and so in terms of you talk about modified inner squads, I'm assuming like kind of like your scripts, kind of like just kind of yeah. keeping it moving. You can say, Hey, we're going to do this a certain count. You yeah. Know, those kind of things. Yeah. And you can modify it based on, okay, you want to get this guy to, you know, we may even reduce the number of pitches outside and send the guy back inside. Oh, uh, okay. We'll, yeah. We'll warm him up. He'll come out and, you know, throw, you know, a certain amount of pitches in the situation. We may, we may extend the inning, give him a couple extra outs, get some more pitches into him. So what we're trying to do is is concern ourselves with the ups and downs he has and the number of pitches he, he's at. Okay. So you can modify your work based on that. It's not, you know, fall is more conducive to an inter squad, but when it's cold, mm -hmm. um, it's not a fun thing to be out there. And uh, their minds are elsewhere. But you're trying to get them prepared. And you don't want to put them at any type of risk. Oh, That's yeah. Yourself and I think you made a great point, too, is like, are we going to play like this? Like, would yeah. we have would we have this game or would we have to cancel? Yeah. Yep. You know, I think that's a great, you know, great perspective to have. You know, some guys just get them out there. But if you're really not, then, you know, what are we doing? Yeah. I, I mean, think it's, it's, it's only fair, you know, you know, you're a Northeast guy. You understand what I'm saying is he, you're going to practice these kids. You want to prepare them because if they're playing in that type of weather, they got to be out there to get acclimated to it. Mm -hmm. um, like, for example, now uh, the weather's I mean, the, the fall's been great. Yeah. But, you know, you're not getting 70 degree weathers in, uh, you know, in April 1st. No. So, you know, now 
Now, you know, I tell, I even tell a co- uh, my camp to now, my, my former assistant now is the head coach. I says, get them outside, get them outside. Okay. Because they're going to have to adapt to this. Um, you, you, you're moving them. Okay. You're not, you're not, you're not you know, you know, you can take your batting practice, just get them used to this. A little bit. Yeah. Like I said, and that March weather there, no, no way. Like this no. is, and it's going mean, to be windy too. To me, it's more windy as well. Well, spring. you know, as well as I do, it's it's not necessarily the temperature. I played oh. golf today; it was forty degrees, but yeah. there was the wind. Right. Fine. Now, forty degrees with wind—that's huh, a whole different animal. Yeah, awful, awful place. Yep, totally agree. So, yeah, I mean, just 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 that in itself is, is such a like. I think it's just great even to have that perspective. Like, how do you navigate it? Because like those are things that most guys are. You know, you don't even sometimes we're planet or, you know, how I think guys, how guys could do it better, you know, giving those different ways of thinking about, I think, like we said about, um, is it right for the player? Can you give me an example of like, what would be an example of like when it's not right for the player or not right? Or maybe it is right for the player. I mean, I mean, obviously you don't, a, if it puts a player at risk, it's not good. Mm-hmm. I mean, you have to be, you error for, towards safety. That's what you, you do. Um, activity. If you you know if you're moving around, I think it, I think it's good. But being in a situation, and that's why I talk about if you're into squatting, for example, and it's cold weather and you're standing around too much, you can be subject to a kid. You know, balls hit and he tries to you know make a quick break on it. You pull a muscle. Oof, yeah. You know, so you know activity. You know, and keeping the guy's body warm. Is 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 especially, you know, important. We know we send we have a a pump room behind the um, um, stadium, and I would send all our pitchers in there, stand in a pump room because I mean it's hot. Mm-hmm. So now you put a guy out in a bullpen in right field, you're gonna free unless you have a, a blower, a hot blower. It's tough to warm up when you when you're frozen. Yeah, how are you gonna warm up? So you try to t- you run back and forth. So I say, you know. Stay in a stay in a pump room, get warmed up, and then when you gotta go, then you gotta get out there. So it would take you less time to get your body going. I'm more concerned about the pitchers in particular, uh, because they're sitting in a bullpen, they're doing nothing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you no, know, we had a red, yellow, green light thing where you know red means get ready, meaning get up, and that's running. Over. Yellow is you're loose, green you're ready to go. Mm-hmm. Okay, so hey, Johnny, red. You give him, give him advance notice. You want to see the guy running back and forth, doing his exercises, doing his bands. Hey, Johnny, yellow, get on that mound throwing. You know, and then, you know, we, we have we you know we had that kind of a code with these guys, but very tough when it's cold out. Very tough. It's gonna be taught too, you know, like in that yeah. system, like what it takes to get out there, like little different things you're taking, or you know, even the when you're telling them like what to wear. Well, hmm. I was uh, I. I had about 25 layers on. Yeah. I was all said. So, you know, some days are just they're brutal. They're yeah. brutal. Um, and mentally, some of these kids are out of there. And they're just, just out of it. And it's tough to perform. It's not, not fun playing in cold weather. It's just not. But the reality of the situation in the Northeast, you got to be able to deal with it. Reality in okay. the Northeast, you know, if you're going to pass up on days and not get your repetitions on the field, uh, you know, when you go down and play at North Carolina or wherever you're going to play, they don't care. They're going to beat your brains in. Mm-hmm. So you try to make them understand, hey, listen, this, this is whether we're going to play in. This is maybe rough, okay, but you need to get your reps in to get ready to perform. And uh, it, it, most of the time these kids settle in on that. But, again, if it's too cold, it's maybe 20 minutes outside, get your work in, we get them back inside. Then we rotate them maybe positionally. Um by groups, maybe by teams. Well, team A go out and team B's hit and vice versa. Um, if it's painful to go outside. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it is. Um, way, you know, the funny thing is I would be the I, I would go I would be the guy to go outside. <laughs> it wasn't it w- it wouldn't be the assistance. So I was the guy who was taking the bullet. And if anybody and I would say to you guys, hey guys, I'm out there. I'm out there for both sessions. So if I can handle it, you can handle it. So use, use the one-upsman on these guys. That's right. That's right. 
Um, I was just thinking about your teams, man. I was just thinking, you know, you, you don't you, you don't become, you know, the the record that you have and the 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 winning is coached on accident and to build a team, right? To build your team, your team wins is how how you have you created um so many good teams, you know, and these teams that have won the 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 turn the biggest tournament in the regular season and you become this um, it's not, I know we've heard development, you hear development scream, like you've, you've talked about it, but how in terms have you helped mold teams? Well, let's be perfectly honest. I say it all the time. I just inducted into New York State Hall of Fame on Sunday. And in the famous words of Lou Kornaseka, you want to be a good coach, get good players. Mm-hmm. Now, if you want to have a good pl- program, get good players that buy into what you're trying to do. Uh, it starts with getting good players that you believe fit your system, your philosophy. It really does. And we all make mistakes on the recruiting end. Uh, You know, you're involved in it. You understand. Uh, But for the most case, when you put a team on the field that has talent and has the characteristics you're looking for, uh, typically the program builds. And the second part of that equation is – you want to be successful. And if you look around the country for a lot of successful programs, there's in many cases, continuity in the coaching staff, mm. uh, continuity in the coaching staff to me is extremely important. I'll point out a couple programs like, a, a you know, Vanderbilt, you know, has been pretty stable there uh, with, with Corbin and uh, with Scotty Brown, who was with me. Um, you got to, you know, uh, Virginia with McMullen and uh, you know, Brian, uh, you know, so your, your good programs, uh, you know, Danny McDonald out there, this pitching coach to Roger Williams, you know, it's, it starts with continuity because what happens is, as you teach, we talk about development, you know, if you have too many coaches change, coaching changes, then those players have to adapt to the coach. So if you have a pitching coach every other year, doesn't mean you're not going to win. It's tough to maintain the stability and some guys may develop, some guys may go backwards. Uh, so if you get a good coaching staff in place, I think that's extremely important along the way. Um, so it's getting good players, you know, building a culture of continuity. And then you talk about pillars, you know, and su- successful pillars. Everybody talks about it. You know, everybody works hard. Everybody works hard. Um, I had work hard, work smart. You know, you can work uh, hard and hard and, and, and not go any places. Like you can keep on throwing dirt on yourself. So it's work hard, work smart to me is is, is one of my mantras. Um, and and it's all about relationships. It's relationships that include communication. We want to constantly co- communicate and collaborate with the player. You know, uh, relationship and gaining trust, caring for them. But collaboration, you may, I may try to be ch- changing your swing and you make don't you don't understand or you don't want you don't believe, but if you allow a conversation with the player and start talking about things, um, you know, you know it's he, he's actually doing it, okay. So he should have input on how it should be done, what he likes, what he doesn't like, okay. You you create that bond and that trust, and that and that player feels hey he's listening to me. I think you get more out of that player. I think that's extremely important along the way. Uh, and, and then to me, um, ath- get athletes. Athletes to me um, will grow, will improve. Um, uh, you know, you can train an athlete now. Play, kids are bigger, stronger, faster. Kids are involved with um, so many different trainers, hitting coaches along the way. Now you got to be able to corral all that stuff and continue that train ro- rolling in the right direction so it's it's this this collaboration not only involves the player and the baseball coaches it involves your entire operation your strength and condition your nutrition okay so he's got to buy into that process and that program and, and all the areas along the way so finding the right kid it starts finding the right kid but there are other elements along the way when you when you talk about continuity of the staff, I think it's such a challenge is like how how do you create a, the the culture of continuity and still help your assistants? <clears throat> let's say maybe 
reach their goals of becoming a head coach? Yeah, that Dre, that's a tough one. Um, boy, you know, I've lost a lot of good guys. Yeah, um, and you've got a huge tree. I mean, I lost a lot of good guys, and I want them to go. I'm right. The first, I'm the first one to promote them <laughs> and tell them to go. Uh, I wish I had the resources to keep them. Um, I just did not have, and it was in their best interest to go um, for their professional career and certainly, you know, financially and, and for the families along the way. Um, that's tough. Yeah. That's a no win. That's a no win situation. Um, because if they're coming and taking your coaches, then you, you're selecting the right coaches. Right. So to answer that question, what I try to do or what I tried to do is always have a couple of guys in my back pocket that I keep an eye on. And I look not necessarily in my situation. I, I just didn't have the revenue or the resources to go in and pluck these guys off another uh, program. I would look at, um, I was kind of looking for up and comers mm-hmm. guys that had, you know, that, that had a good reputation out there. You can see that they worked hard. Um, you may have got to know him or if you had, you have contacts that will tell you, Hey, this guy's good or whatever. Um, that's, that's how I went about my business, uh, along the way. So, um, um, <clears throat> but you know, I've, I've been blessed, you know, I, I had Scott for nine and I think Corey for five, uh, George Brown now is with me. So, um, uh, Mike Hampton was with me for 19 and he had some opportunities, but, uh, he decided to stay, you know, he turned down some things. Um, there's not a lot of jobs in the Northeast. Right. Not a lot of jobs. You know, you, you know, um, hopefully with this, uh, with, with the passing, we're going to get some more paid coaches. Uh, so to allow a lot of these, there's a lot of young guys out there. And there's a lot of guys during my tenure that had to leave the profession because they just couldn't afford the livelihood. Yep. And that, that, that to me is disturbing. I mean, there's a couple of guys in men. This, this guy could be a good coach, but you know, family, you know, he had to, he had to earn some money and wasn't paying. Right. Wasn't paying. Yeah, it's a definitely uh, unique. It's such a challenge, especially in baseball, you know, to try and do it. And then you have guys that are really good at it. And, yeah, yeah. just life happens. Yeah, it's life. It's a life. And you have to make those decisions along the way. Well. Well, coach, I know we're here. We're here already over an hour. Uh, and so I just I, maybe just just wrapping up here, if there's – uh, any type of advice, anything else that we might haven't covered that you'd like to touch base about? Um, not really, but, you know, you, we'll talk, you know, just basically, you know, the game is changing. Yeah. You have to be able to adapt. I think that's important. And when I say the game is changing, there is so much information out there, Trey. It's unbelievable. You got some really smart and creative guys. You have the, you know, the analytics that are out there, that there's a volume of information. Um, but I, I still think the game is the game. Teach the game the right way. And when you are evaluating information, you better synthesize it. When I say synthesize it, filter it out and find out what's beneficial for you as a coach. If, if, it, if it involves your development or when you're going to use it for a player, you know, understand uh, what you can use, what you can't use, and what that player can consume. Mm. Um, everybody thinks uh, with all this TrackMan data and uh, you know the, all the annex, uh, you know, true media. There's so much, but how much can that person take? And uh, I, I just think the information highway is so fast. I think we get up. We better get into the uh, sometimes into the slow lane and really look at this and examine how it impacts the player and how it impacts how you play the game. Um, that's one of my bugaboos with the, uh, with professional baseball. Uh, sometimes you move too fast and you try to make a player that's not that type of player into that player. And uh, you're taking away that person's strength. So case by case, um, team by team situation. Wow. I, I, I just uh, just really appreciate the time, Coach. Just want to respect your time here. We've got a while. I just uh, really thank you for, you know, just talking some baseball, man. This is a great – I love this. I just love talking baseball, and yeah. I really enjoyed it. Really, really enjoyed it. Well, I hope I give you a couple tidbits here. You know, um, <laughs> love the game. You know, love baseball guys like yourself. 
that really have a passion to learn, um, a passion to promote the game, uh, want to be better as a coach, want to be, you know, and want to make this game better. Um, it's a great game. I said, still say it's a great game, bad business. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, it's changing. We have to adapt, but we, we still have to be cautious of how we adapt. And uh, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. And thank you for inviting me on your program. Coach Blankmeyer, just some incredible information. Just I love the one pitch game that he plays. I love the situation they bring, though the real life. It reminds me so much. Uh, just, just Coach Roberts talk about like throwing the bullpens on the real mound and throwing the game, like and, and making the game like so. Like this is a step farther of it. You know, Coach Blankmeyer is writing a script about it, putting different situations in. There is a situation that maybe certain guys need to need to get. I uh, need to work on, and then going back and finishing their work in the bullpen. Like I said, if they need to work on the changeup more, they got to work on their slide step or the rhythm or whatever the case is. They can work on that in the bullpen later. But to give everyone time, always to the training of getting them in the bullpen. Um, so the one pitch stuff was great. Um, a lot of even the great stuff nuggets that we got after you know we we stopped pressing record. We just got again just kept on talking. Um, and just his philosophy, just I'm going to coach you the way you need to be coached. That's his philosophy. Um, continue to be a learner. He's, uh, as, a, as a coach, I'm going to let you do what you do right now, and then we're going to collaborate it and make it better and see where you're at. So uh, it's just a, just great stuff uh, from Coach. Just uh, the passion is, is, is there. Uh, it's, 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 it's great. It's inspiring. It's it's. Um, feeling very fortunate to talk to such a great baseball man and um, a legend in our game. And you can tell, tell from it, you know, the, the developments there, the situations, uh, the, the details are there, mental game, um, talked about the full program from nutrition, from s s strength and conditioning, um, and it was just uh, in in a lot of fun and uh, a great baseball conversation that I was fortunate to have, and I hope that you guys all enjoyed it, and, because uh, I know, I know I did, and I can't wait, uh, again, to talk to Coach Mark Marshall again, and Coach, I appreciate you, thank you for what you're doing, thank you for all you do, and thank you everyone for sticking with us, and enjoying this episode, hope you did, and until next time, keep getting better. <laughs>